Good evening and welcome to this fall's book buzz. My name is Betty McDowell. I'm one of the adult services librarians here at Pflugerville Public Library, and I'm joined by our cataloging and technical services librarian, Shermaine Burleson. She'll be going over adult fiction. I'll be going over adult nonfiction, and our other adult services librarian, Meg Miller, will be going over adult graphic novels. Just a reminder, if you need help finding a book, you can go to the books and media section of our website. And under adult book list, you can submit a form, either the Your Next Reads form or the Book Bundles form. And we'll either send you a personalized list of suggested titles, or if you'd like a surprise with the book bundles, we'll check out some books to you. And with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Shermaine and she's going to be covering adult fiction. Hi, my name is Shermaine Burleson and I'm the Tech Services Librarian here at Fogelville Public Library, and I am going to talk about some new books that are going to be coming out for the fall. The Dating Playbook by Farrah Rashawn is about Taylor Powell, who's a personal trainer, who math ain't mathing. Like, her bills are piling up, uh, the rent is due, and she needs more than the support from her best friends to make ends meet or to have the life that she wanted to create. She needs a miracle. And the miracle's name is Jamar Dixon. And he is a former football player that wants to get back to the NFL. And he wants Taylor to train him. But there's just one catch. Nobody can know what they're doing. So when... She agrees to train him and they're accidentally outed as a couple. Um, her game plan is turned upside down and she starts to wonder if Jamar is just playing to win so he can get back in the NFL or if he's playing for keeps. So will they or won't they? The Heart Principle by Helen Huang um, is about a violinist named Anna Soon, who had a career as a violinist and accidentally becomes a YouTube-like sensation. So she finds herself burnt out from the attempts to replicate this moment consistently as a violin player. But um, to add to the stress of trying to recreate this sensation in this moment that created this sensation her long-term birth friend um announces that he wants like this open relationship so she was like if he wants an open relationship so do i so she decides that she's gonna do the same thing but she's gonna have like these string of one eye stands and the more unacceptable the man is the better so she meets Quan Dip, who is like tattooed, motorcycle riding, MMA fighter type guy. And they have what they think is going to be this one I stand. But then there's a second and there's a third. And she's trying to figure out why, like he sees her more than anybody else, even her self. And, you know, what all of this means, because they're totally not supposed to be together or supposed to work. So then a tragedy strikes in Anna's family and a role that she wasn't prepared for suddenly becomes a role that she has to take on. And Anna and Quan have to fight to see if the chance at love that they're willing to take is worth it, but they also have to fight for themselves. So that's what the heart principle is about. Gold in these hills. So gold in these hills is a past and present type story. Um, so Juniper is basically a mail order bride that arrives in Kentworth, California um, with the prospect of gold mining and like escape and adventure and all these different things. And so she finds this loving man who is waiting for her, but when the mine suddenly becomes empty of profit, um, Juniper's husband, John, like vanishes and she's left to fend for herself with her young daughter in this boom town that's becoming a ghost town now. So Juniper pins letters to her husband, um, but she feels like she's waiting on a ghost, like he doesn't exist anymore. And then perhaps 
um, even worse that he's an outlaw and that's why he hasn't come back to her. So she's trying to survive in this dwindling town that's becoming this ghost town and the kindness of strangers and, and the kindness of the community and the few remaining people who still live there becomes something she has to rely on. Um, including there's a person who may be able to unlock the mystery of her husband's disappearance and her survival depends not only on these friends, but also on her part, like fighting to maintain um, the love that she feels like her and John absolutely had or have. And then in the present day, Johnny Sutherland, he throws himself into raising his kids and restoring this 100 year old abandoned farmhouse in what was once known in Kentworth, California, in the San Jacinto Mountains. And while he's exploring this house, he uncovers Juniper's letters and he's moved by these accounts that bear his name because his name is Johnny or John and the love story that unfolds. And he discovers that there might be hope and resilience um, within himself as well. And so this is a masterpiece of faith and perseverance and love that changes the course of history. Several people are typing. So several people are typing is a novel that is set in Slack messages. And so um, it's like The Office, but if The Office, <laughs> the show was only in Slack messages. Um, so Gerald is this public relations employee and he's like mid-level. And so suddenly he's been uploaded into the company's internal Slack channels um, at least like his consciousness has. So his colleagues assume that he's just trying to circumvent the work from home policy. But when Gerald becomes super productive, his employees are like happy to let him work from home or wherever he says he is. So when he is faced with thinking about like his life being in this limbo and disembodied online forever, he ask his coworker Prandeep to help him escape to find out what happened to his body. But the longer he's in this void or this limbo, like the more it becomes appealing to maybe stay in this reality. But meanwhile, his colleagues are having like all these PR catastrophes on their own. And like their biggest client is in the midst of recalling like this bad batch of food that allegedly poisoned like Pomeranians like nationwide. And so the CEO is trying to fix all of these problems and they're all trying to collectively keep one of their biggest clients from like going into bankruptcy and trying to revamp that company's image. And then you're also dealing with them feeling like if Gerald can work from home, why can't we work from home and all the office politics and things that go with that. And so what do all these things mean? And while the office paranoia and politics that follow us home when we think about um, working from home and what we've been through during the pandemic, um, this author like captures like the relatable and absurd factors that make up all the things that we think about when we are trying to just be productive employees and what that means for the human connection and for us and our passions and our jobs. These toxic things. So um, Mickey Lambert creates digital scrapbooks for clients and she ensures that souvenirs that are precious to their owners aren't lost or forgotten. But her latest client, Nadia, um, is a curio shop owner and she dies from this apparent suicide. So Mickey honors the woman's last wish and begins curating her objects to art, like music blocks and hair clip, a keychain, and all these 12 items that add up to 12 items um, end up meaning something to Nadia, who collected them over like flea market scavenges and across the country. But they mean a lot to somebody else too. And um, Mickey has been receiving threatening messages to leave Nadia's past alone. And it's becoming a mystery that she's driven to solve. 
And who did these things belong to? And how did Nadia really come to possess them? And discovering the truth crosses her with a path in to the path of a thought to be long dominant serial killer and a sinister past. And she is starting to wonder if she's going to survive all of this. So that's what these toxic things are, is about. Um, Read My Lips is about basically, yes, temptation, but opening yourself up to possibilities. So Claire Lennox, she thought she had it all. And till she trusted the wrong man and she basically felt like her career and her life, her reputation, her heart, everything was destroyed. So now she's the director of a literacy foundation and she has new hopes and new dreams. And then she feels like she's being tempted again and she doesn't know if she wants to go there. And so billionaire chocolatier Clayton McClare, he risked everything when he goes like incognito, um, hoping to overcome this dyslexia that haunts him and has haunted him his whole life and just threatens to destroy this image that he's crafted for himself. And they might be perfect for each other, except that she doesn't know he's a billionaire. So can they overcome that? Um, Is it once bitten, twice shy? What is happening? What's going to go on? No Gods, No Monsters by Cadwell Turnbull. So this novel is a um, contemporary kind of fantasy reality. Um, these types of tropes that come into this book. So this is the complexities about injustice and identity. And contemporary fantasy is becoming um, a big genre and so is contemporary anything kind of right now but this book is about um Leanna gets the news that her brother has been shot and killed by Boston cops but what looks like a case of police brutality um becomes something bigger and what's revealed is that monsters are real and they want everyone to know it so there's like local werewolf packs are threatened into silence and um There's all these mysterious secret societies and people that have these unique abilities that are like trying to seek refuge in all these types of people and organizations. And people are starting to disappear and suicides and hate crimes are starting to increase. And then protests are erupting globally for or against monsters. But A lot of people are not stopping to think of why now and what has monsters so scared that they will reveal themselves. And then the world's going to find out what's worse than monsters. So this is a good book to read. A lot like Adios, Alexis Daria um, also wrote You Had Me at Ola. And so this is a second chance romance between commitment phobic um, Gabriel Aguilar and... Michelle Amato. So Michelle is from a a Puerto Rican Italian family in New York. And so she doesn't really believe in love. Her family is very, (laughs) she's kind of like the black sheep of the family because she has not been married. Um, And they want her to settle down. And the only guy that ever made her happy, like disappeared like 13 years ago. And he was her best friend. His name was basically Gabe or Gabriel. So Gabriel Aguilar, he escaped like the Bronx and his family's expectations and um, his best friend and longtime crush. So he becomes like the co-owner of like this L.A celebrity gym and when the investor wants to open up in a new york location it's the last thing that he wants to do but he if he wants this investor and him to work together they have to so when michelle is basically um the new campaign marketing campaign manager like everything that he's been running from sort of catches up with him 
So she's torn between, um, Michelle is torn between holding Gabe like at arm's length of like, you know, or like moving back to where they kind of like left off. All the while there's working on this campaign and like old feelings resurface and like, can they resolve these mistakes or is it a matter of time before um, Gabe has to leave again or nothing happens between them? And their families think that they're dating. And so it's just like, uh, there's like all these uncertainties about what can possibly happen. So that's what a lot like Adios is about. The Harlem Shuffle is a story. Oops. Sorry. Um, is a story about Harlem and about <laughs> family and connections and the pull between um right and wrong. So Ray Canary is basically slightly crooked. So he's not all the way in the streets, but he's not all the way into like the good life. So to his customers and his neighbors on 125th street in Harlem, he's an upstanding salesman um, and all these type of things. And he's expecting his second child with his wife and everything is going like pretty good. And there are few people that know he's descended from like hoods and crooks and like all these things about normalcy and like being an upstanding person or whatever are starting to crack because his family, his cousins are starting to pull him into that part of the life that's been more hidden that he's been like straddling. And so there's this internal tussle between him as a striver of trying to do better and break these curses, generational curses, or um, becoming a full-time crook. Um, and this double life is starting to catch up with him. And he's trying to save his cousin. He's trying to score this big, um, like, pay out from this robbery he's trying to sort of participate in. Um, there's all these things happening um, and the facade is starting to crack. So this is um, a recreation of like New York in the early 60s. And it's a family saga and a crime novel and a morality play. And it's about race and power and ultimately um, the love letter to Harlem. And so this author wrote The Underground Railroad and The Nickel Boys as well. Nice Girls by Catherine Dang is basically like a pulse pounding, like um, all the missing girls, the luckiest girls alive. Um, it explores the dark side of girlhood and it's asking uh, what is more dangerous for a woman, showing the world what it wants to see or who like you really are as a woman. Um, is there a difference? Um, and Mary used to be like such a nice girl and she was like, all set to go to this Ivy league. And she was like the cute chubby kid. But three years later, she's back and she sort of got kicked out of Cornell and she won't tell anyone why. And she takes a job at the local grocery store and just kind of wants to go on about her life. But then her former best friend, Olivia Willen, goes missing and um, she's admired by everyone. But Mary knows sort of who she really was underneath all of those things. And she wonders if her disappearance might be tied to another missing person who's a 19 year old, Delmara Jackson, um, who's been kind of dismissed as a runaway. And then it's like, who is the real Olivia and where did she go and what happened to Del Maria? And um, Mary tries to find all of these things down um, and prize at basically what are the facades surrounding these two missing girls. And so Nice Girls um, is about that and the haunting mystery of um, current affair events and kind of like what goes into what happens when a person is missing. And if you've read Alyssa Coles when no one is watching, it's a millennium um, armchair kind of detective type mystery. And if you're a true crime addict, it'll intensify your desire for justice. Um, so this is what Nice Girls is about. 
The Bookbinder's Daughter by Jessica Thorne. Um, this book is a magical realism, um, but with a contemporary kind of twist. So Sophie is offered this job at um, Erendale Library, and it's a collection of world books from all over the world, like the finest collection of rare books in the world. And she's the last, like, bookbinder in her family um, because her mother went missing when she was a teenager and she was a bookbinder as well. And so she leaps at the chance to try to figure out what happened to her mother and why she abandoned her um, because she always believed that she abandoned her. So she goes into this world of this, you know, basically eccentric binders and the keepers of the library and so a lot of the keepers are reluctant to speak about like her mother and kind of like what happened and she's the only person who can read like the strange spells in the oldest books on display and they were written in this forgotten language that nobody else understands and so the mystery only continues to deepen when Sophia stumbles on like this elaborate carved door and it has a pattern exactly like the matching pendant that her mother left like a long time ago just like this delicate like engraved leaf but then the door opens and like she discovers this world and all of these things and this is about long hidden family secrets and the magic that lurks between the pages of every ancient book so will the family be restored don't know. First Love Take Two by Sanjani Patel. So, uh, Preeti um, is becoming a doctor and she should be very happy about that. Um, but she's really anxious and like she's trying to manage her residency and the stress and anxiety that she's having surrounding like becoming a doctor. And so she's not even thinking about love or anything like that. But when she finds a new place to stay, her new roommate happens to be her ex. And he's super hot, of course. Um, he's an amazing cook and he's practically perfect. But their families, wow, their families, they might have had a have happily ever after. But it's hard to move forward with that because... How can they overcome and fight for each other um, in spite of or despite their families? And are they going to lose their second chance? Other People's Things. So Other People's Things is about a jailbird klepto and spectacular failure to launch Nicole Wood, who... Um, tendency to have sticky fingers have earned her many names but it's not stealing she has a compulsion or a gift where things that need to be placed in the right place she has a knack for finding those things and relocating those objects to where they need to be but her marriage is on the rocks and she has no real skills so instead of going to prison she's determined to change her ways um to change her image. So things look up when her sister's house cleaning business um, needs like another person to help. And so she goes into this client's home and she figures, uh, you know, I'll do what I normally do or do this again. And then, you know, this should help. This should be okay. So she relocates this paperback that she finds to another client's home. And she hopes that nobody will notice and it'll be fine. But it's not. And there's long hidden secrets and triggers um, and to fateful events that destroy the life she's creating and hurt the closest people to her. And she needs to either embrace this unwielding gift and like control it and take a chance on love in order to fix what's basically wrong. So that's what other people's things is about. The body scout. So in the future, you can have anybody you want as long as you can afford it. But with repeat pandemics and 
climate change is just ravaging the country, um, Kobo is barely speaking, scraping by. So he basically um, is like scouting for um, big pharma owned baseball teams and his own cyber cybernetics is basically um, kind of like what it's called um, is out of date and like he's just trying to figure out how all of this works together. And then his brother, um, JJ Zoom, who is um, like a batter for the Mons, uh, Monsanto Mets, I think that's how you say it. Um, he's murdered at the home plate during a game. And so he's determined to find this killer and he's going into this world of genetically modified CEOs and back alley body modifications. And this is more corrupt than he ever imagined. And to keep himself together when everything is falling apart, he has to find a way between body and soul and who's being sold to the highest bidder. So this is um, a science fiction thriller set in the all too possible future people may feel. Um, but this is just about discovering like who we are when we can make ourselves literally into almost anything if you can afford it. Um, the Girl at My Door is basically a true crime story um, that's inspired by an actual real true crime story, Rillington Place, which is um, a story about John Reginald Christie, who was a serial killer. And he's actually the reason why the death penalty was abolished in um, part of the reason why the death penalty was abolished in England, because the man who was accused of doing the murders that he committed was executed in his place first. Um, but this is a story inspired by that. And it's one of Britain's most infamous um, cases. So Queenie Osborne um, is rising to fame as this famous singer after World War II. So it's the 50s. And she wants to head to New York to make her fortune. So on the surface, John Reginald Christie is an ordinary man by day. And he wanders the bustling streets of London. And by night, um, he's entertained by Queenie and her band. He's searching for prey. And this young waitress named Joy catches his eye. And it becomes like this dangerous obsession for him. And Joy is prepared to marry Charles Gilchrist, one of um, the city's most eligible bachelors, but um, Queenie has always liked him and the spark between them is obvious. And so when she betrays Joy in the ultimate, ultimate way, um, she knows her bright future is at risk and she doesn't have anywhere to turn. So the one man who can help her is John Reginald Christie. But she has no idea that there's dark secrets that lie uh, behind the doors of 10 Willington Place. And as Christy sees her approaching, like, is he going to risk everything for this latest victim? And it blends like real life stories with notorious serial killer John Reginald Christy um, and fictionalized killer, uh, fictionalized um, characters in this thrilling mystery. The Sweetest Remedy is by Jane Igaro. I hope I'm saying that right. Um, but I recommended The Ties That Tether as another book. And this, so this is a um, the second book by the same author. So this um, Hannah Bailey is traveling to Nigeria to meet um, the family of the father that she never knew in a funeral that she's attending is her father's funeral. Um, and she's meeting the family that she never knew. And there's a new love interest that could happen. And she discovers like all these things about her that she didn't know she was missing. So um, Hannah is the result of a Nigerian entrepreneur who had a brief relationship with her white mother. And because of this, Hannah has always felt uncertain about her identity. So when her father dies and she's invited to Nigeria for the funeral, she wants to hate him. But she's curious about um, 
who he was. And so she's searching for answers. So she goes to Lagos, um, Nigeria. Um, the Banana Island, one of Nigeria's most affluent areas, um, she meets this guy, Jalatis, um, her late father's prestigious family. Um, and some accept her and some don't. And so the days leading up to the funeral are like really chaotic, but she like uncovers the secrets and the culture she never thought she would understand. She starts to appreciate. And this man that steals her heart makes her see like life in a whole new light. When Things Get Dark is an anthology inspired by Shirley Jackson. So Ellen, um, that low is a um, horror and mystery editor. And so she and some other authors have come together to uh, bring their own personal tribute to Shirley Jackson. So that's what these stories are about. The Ex-Hex by Aaron Sterling. Um, so this is about um, a woman named Vivian Jones who had a broken heart. And like any young witch would or maybe could, she decides to cast a spell to curse her ex. And she isn't worried about it because she's just thinking maybe he'll have a bad hair day or two and it'll be fine. Until um, Rice Pin Hollow, a descendant of the town's ancestors, um, he comes back to town. And what should be like this quick trip um, to the annual festival and just like all the things that um, town founders usually do, everything starts to go wrong. And when one thing after another starts happening to Rice, she realizes that this little silly spell might not have been as harmless at all. And so suddenly when the town is under attack from ghosts and cats and wind up toys and everything in between, um, they have to ignore their chemistry to basically try to work together to save the town or do they? Um, but they have to break the curse before it's too late. And that's what the X hex is about. Please email me, um, send me recommendations of fiction you would like to read of books. Um, please let me know like how we're doing of things that you want us to buy or things that you might want to read. And please don't hesitate to email me and let me know how we're doing. Thanks a lot. See you soon. And we're going to start off with biographies and memoirs. And first up is Seeing Ghosts by Kat Chow. Kat Chow has always been unusually fixated on death. She worried constantly about her parents dying, especially her mother. A vivacious and mischievous woman, Kat's mother made a morbid joke that would haunt her for years to come. When she died, she'd like to be stuffed and displayed in Kat's future apartment in order to always watch over her. After her mother dies unexpectedly from cancer, Kat, her sisters, and their father are plunged into a debilitating lonely grief. With a distinct voice that is wry and heartfelt, Kat weaves together a story of the fallout of grief that follows her extended family as they immigrate from China and Hong Kong to Cuba and America. Seeing Ghosts asks what it means to reclaim and tell your family's story. Is it an exorcism or is it right, its own form of preservation? The result is an extraordinary new contribution to the literature of the American family and a provocative and transformative meditation on who we become facing loss. Next up is Poet Warrior by Joy Harjo. Joy is the first Native American to serve as U.S. Poet Laureate, and she invites us to travel along the heartaches, losses, and humble realizations of her Poet Warrior Road and her follow-up to Crazy Brave. Harjo listens to stories of ancestors and family, the poetry and music that she first encountered as a child, and the messengers of a changing earth. She celebrates the influences that shaped her poetry, grieves at the loss of her mother, reckons with the theft of her ancestral homeland, and sheds light on the rituals that nourish her as an artist, mother, wife, and community member. Moving fluidly between prose, song, and poetry, Harjo recounts a luminous journey of becoming, a spiritual map that will help us all find home. And Gabrielle Union has another book, You Got Anything Stronger. Gabrielle Union, actor and author of We're Going to Need More Wine, is back with new stories covering her fertility journey, motherhood, and her career. 
This is Gabrielle at her most honest, and she shares her life's challenges and joys and emphasizes the strength found through vulnerability. And Dave Grohl of the Foo Fighters has a new memoir out called The Storyteller, Tales of Life and Music. Dave shares what it's like to be a kid from Springfield, Virginia, walking through life while living out the wild dreams he had as a young musician. From hitting the road with Scream at 18 years old to his time in Nirvana and the Foo Fighters, jamming with Iggy Pop or playing at the Academy Awards or dancing with ACDC and the Preservation Hall Jazz Band, drumming for Tom Petty or meeting Sir Paul McCourtney at Royal Albert Hall, bedtime stories with Joan Jett or a chance meeting with Little Richard, to flying halfway around the world for one epic night with his daughters. And from Don Turner, we have three girls from Bronzeville. They were three black girls, Don, her sister Kim, and her best friend Deborah. They bonded as they roamed the concrete landscape of Bronzeville, a historic neighborhood on Chicago's South Side, the destination of hundreds of thousands of black folks who fled the ravages of the Jim Crow South. These third generation daughters of the Great Migration can't come of age in the 1970s in the warm glow of the recent civil rights movement. It has offered them a promise that they will have more opportunities, rights, and freedoms than any generation of black Americans in history. But the girls have much more immediate concerns, hiding under the dining room table and eavesdropping on grown folks' business, collecting secret treasures and daydreaming about their futures. And then fate intervenes, first slowly and then dramatically, sending them careening in wildly different directions. There's heartbreak, loss, displacement, displacement, and even murder. Dawn struggles to make sense of the shocking turns that consume her sister and her best friend, all while asking herself a simple but profound question, why? Three Girls from Bronzeville is a tour de force about a complex interplay of race, class, and opportunity, and how those forces shape our lives and our capacity for resilience and redemption. And Will Smith has written a book titled Will. Will Smith's transformation from a fearful child in a tense West Philadelphia home to one of the biggest rap stars of his era and then one of the biggest movie stars in Hollywood history is an epic tale of inner transformation and outer triumph. And Will tells it astonishingly well, but it's only half the story. This memoir is the product of a profound journey of self-knowledge, a reckoning with all that your will can get you and all that it can leave behind. Will is the story of how one person mastered his own emotions written in a way that can help everyone else do the same. The combination of genuine wisdom, this combination of genuine wisdom, of universal value, and a life story that is preposterously entertaining, even astonishing, puts Will, the book, like its author, in a category by itself. And next we have All About Me, My Remarkable Life and Show Business by Mel Brooks. For anyone who loves American comedy, the long wait is over. All About Me charts Mel Brooks's meteoric rise from a depression-era kid in Brooklyn to the recipient of the National Medal of Arts. Whether serving in the United States Army in World War II or during his burgeoning career as a teenage comedian in the Catskills, Mel was always mining his experiences for material, always looking for the perfect joke. He would go on to write, direct, and star in The Twelve Chairs, Blazing Saddles, Young Frankenstein, Silent Movie, High Anxiety, and Spaceballs, as well as produce many other groundbreaking and eclectic films and then went on to conquer Broadway with his record-breaking Tony Award-winning musical, The Producers. Filled with tales of struggle, achievement, and camaraderie in dozens of photographs, readers will gain a more personal and deeper understanding of the incredible body of work behind one of the most accomplished and beloved entertainers in history. And we've got a couple of history books. Starting with From Warsaw with Love, Polish Spies, the CIA, and the Forging of an Unlikely Alliance by John Pomfret. This saga begins in 1990. As the United States cobbles together a coalition to undo Saddam Hussein's invasion of Kuwait, six U.S. officers are trapped in Iraq with intelligence that could ruin Operation Desert Storm if it is obtained by the brutal Iraqi dictator. Desperate, the CIA asks Poland, a longtime Cold War foe famed for its excellent spies, for help. And Warsaw sends a veteran ex-communist spy who had battled the West for decades to rescue the six Americans. John Pomfret's gripping account of the 1990 cliffhanger in Iraq is just the beginning of the tale about intelligence cooperation between Poland and the United States. Pomfret uncovers new details about the CIA's black site program that held suspected terrorists in Poland after 9-11, as well as the role of Polish spies in the hunt for Osama bin Laden. In the tradition of the most memorable works on espionage, 
Pofford's book tells a distressing and disquieting tale of moral ambiguity in which right and wrong, black and white, are not conveniently distinguishable. Next up, we have The 1619 Project by Nicole Hannah-Jones. In late August 1619, a ship arrived in the British colony of Virginia bearing a cargo of 20 to 30 enslaved people from Africa. The arrival led to the barbaric and unprecedented system of American chattel slavery that would last the next 250 years. This is sometimes referred to as the country's original sin, but it's more than that. It is the source of so much that still defines the United States. The New York Times Magazine's award-winning 1619 Project issue reframed our understanding of American history by placing slavery and its continuing legacy at the center of our national narrative. This book substantially expands on that work, weaving together 18 essays that explore the legacy of slavery in present-day America with 36 poems and works of fiction that illuminate key moments of oppression, struggle, and resistance. And by H.W. Brands, we have our first Civil War, Patriots and Loyalists in the American Revolution. <clears throat> what causes people to forsake their country and take arms against it? What prompts their neighbors, hardly distinguishable in station or success, to defend that country against the rebels? That is the question H.W. Brands answers in his powerful new history of the American Revolution. George Washington, Benjamin Franklin, and John Adams all became rebels against the British Empire that fostered their success. Others in the same circle of family and friends chose differently. William Franklin might have been expected to join his father, Benjamin, in rebellion, but remain loyal to the British. So did Thomas Hutchinson, a royal governor and friend of the Franklins, and Joseph Galloway, an early challenger to the crown. They soon heard themselves denounced as traitors for not having betrayed the country where they grew up. Native Americans and the enslaved were also forced to choose sides as civil war broke out around them. After the revolution, the patriots were cast as heroes and founding fathers, while the loyalists were relegated to bit parts best forgotten. Our first civil war reminds us that before America could win its revolution against Britain, the patriots had to win a bitter civil war against family, neighbors, and friends. And we've got some funny books for you, starting with Phoebe Robinson's new book, Please Don't Sit on My Bed in Your Outside Clothes. New York Times bestselling author, comedian, actress, and producer, Phoebe Robinson is back with her most must-read book yet. In her brand new collection, Phoebe shares stories that will make you laugh, but also plenty that will hit you in the heart, inspire a little bit of rage, and maybe a lot of action. That means sharing her perspective on performative allyship, white guilt, exploring what it's like to be a woman who doesn't want kids, living in a society where motherhood is the crowning achievement of a straight cis woman's life, and how the dire state of mental health in America means that taking care of one's mental health, aka self-care, usually requires disposable money. Please don't sit on my bed in your outside clothes. It's not only a brilliant look at our current cultural moment, it's also a collection that will stay with readers for years to come. And Jamie Foxx has a new book out, Act Like You've Got Some Sense and Other Things My Daughter Taught Me. Jamie Foxx has won an Academy Award and a Grammy Award, laughed with sitting presidents, and partied with the biggest names in hip-hop. But he is most proud of his role as father to two very independent young women, Corinne and Annalise. Jamie might not always know what he's doing when it comes to raising girls, but luckily he has a strong example to follow. His beloved late grandmother, Estelle Marie Talley, who he describes as Medea before Tyler Perry put on the pumps in the gray wig. In Act Like You Got Some Sense, a title is inspired by Estelle, Jamie shares up close and personal stories about the tough love and old school values he learned growing up in the small town of Terrell, Texas, his early days trying to make it in Hollywood, the joys and challenges of achieving stardom, and how each phase of his life shaped his parenting journey. Hilarious, poignant, and always brutally honest, this is Jamie Foxx like we've never seen him before. And for true crime, we have Rogue's Gallery, The Birth of Modern Policing and Organized Crime in Gilded Age, New York by John Aller. Rogue's Gallery is a sweeping epic tale of two revolutions, one feeding off the other, that played out on the streets of New York City during an era known as the Gilded Age. For centuries, New York had been a haven of crime. But in, early, in the early 1870s, an Irish cop by the name of Thomas Burns developed new ways to catch criminals. Mugshots, daily lineups, and the famed Rogue's Gallery allowed police to track repeat offenders, and the third-degree interrogation method induced recalcitrant crooks to confess. Burns worked cases methodically, interviewing witnesses, analyzing crime scenes, and developing theories that helped close the books on previously unsolvable crimes. Yet as policing became ever more specialized and efficient, crime itself began to change. 
robberies became bolder and more elaborate, murders grew more ruthless and macabre, and the street gangs of old transformed into hierarchical criminal enterprises, giving birth to organized crime, including the mafia. As the decades unfolded, corrupt cops and clever criminals at times blurred together, giving way to waves of police reform at the hands of men like Theodore Roosevelt. Set against the backdrop of New York's Gilded Age, Rose Gallery is a fascinating story of the origins of modern policing and organized crime in an eventful era with echoes for our own time. And I've got a few science books for you, starting with Buzz, When Nature Breaks the Law by Mary Roach. What's to be done about a jaywalking moose? A bear caught breaking and entering? A murderous tree? 300 years ago, animals that broke the law would be assigned legal representation and put on trial. These days, as New York Times bestselling author Mary Roach discovers, the answers are best found not in jurisprudence, but in science. The curious science of human-wildlife conflict, a discipline at the crossroads of human behavior and wildlife bi biology. Roach reveals as much about humanity as about nature's lawbreakers. When it comes to problem wildlife, she finds humans are more often the problem and the solution. Buzz offers hope for compassionate coexistence in our ever-expanding human habitat. And by Howard Markle, we have The Secret of Life, Rosalind Franklin, James Watson, Francis Crick, and the discovery of DNA's double helix. James Watson and Francis Crick's 1953 discovery of the double helix structure of DNA is the foundation of virtually every advance in our modern understanding of genetics and molecular biology. But how did Watson and Crick do it, and why were they want the ones who succeeded? In truth, the discovery of DNA structure is the story of five towering minds in pursuit of the advancement of science, and for almost all of them, the prospect of fame and immortality. But it's Rosalind Franklin, fiercely determined, relentless, and an outsider at Cambridge and the University of London in the 1950s, as a lone Jewish woman among, among male, young male scientists who become a focal point for Markle. The Secret of Life is a story of genius and perseverance, but also a saga of cronyism, misogyny, anti-Semitism, and misconduct, drawing on voluminous archival research, including interviews with James Watson and with Franklin's sister, Jennifer Glynn. Marco provides a fascinating look at how science is done, how reputations are undone, and how history is written and revised. <laughs> and by Alice Bell, we have our biggest experiment in epic history of climate crisis. In our biggest experiment, Alice Bell takes us back to climate change, climate change science's earliest steps in the 18th and 19th centuries through the point when concern started to rise in the 1950s and right up to today where the debate is over and the world is finally starting to face up to the reality that things are going to get a lot hotter, a lot drier in some places, and a lot wetter in others with catastrophic consequences for most of Earth's biomes. Our biggest experiment recounts how the world became addicted to fossil fuels how we discovered that electricity could be a savior, and how renewable energy is far from a 20th century discovery. Bell cuts through complicated jargon and jumbles of numbers to show how we're getting to grips with what is now the defining issue of our time. The message she relays is ultimately hopeful. Harnessing the ingenuity and intelligence that has driven the history of climate change research can result in a more sustainable and bearable future for humanity. And from Parks and Recreation's Nick Offerman, he's got a new book, Where the Deer and the Antelope Play. In his new book, Nick takes a humorous, inspiring, and elucidating trip to America's trails, farms, and frontier to examine the people who inhabit the land, what that has meant to them and us, and to the land itself, both historically and currently. His quest inspired some deepish thinking from Nick about the history and philosophy of our relationship with nature in our national parks, in our farming, and in our backyards, what we mean when we talk about conservation and the importance of outdoor recreation, all subjects very close to Nick's heart. With witty, heartwarming stories and a keen insight into the human problems we all confront, this is both a ramble through and a celebration of a land we still love. And we've got a few sports books, starting with Abe Streep's Brothers on Three. March 11, 2017 was a night to remember. In front of the hopeful eyes of thousands of friends, family, members, and fans, the Arley Warriors would finally bring the high school basketball state championship title home to the Flathead Indian Reservation. The game would become the stuff of legend, with the boys revered as local heroes. The team's place in Montana history was now cemented, but for starters, Will Messeth, 
Junior and Philip Militaire, life would keep moving on. Senior year was only just beginning. In Brothers on Three, we follow Phil and Will, along with their teammates, coaches, and families as they balance the pressures of adolescence, shoulder the dreams of their community, and chart their own individual courses for the future. Brothers on Three is not simply a story about high school basketball, about state championships, and a winning team. It is a book about community, and it is about boys on the cusp of adulthood, finding their way through the intersecting worlds they inhabit and forging their own paths to personhood. And by Allie Nolan, we have Master the Marathon, the ultimate training guide for women. As recently as 1966, women were forbidden to run in the marathon. Professionals, including doctors, believed it was physically impossible and dangerous for women to run more than a mile and a half. Today, women make up almost half of the marathoning population. Yet most marathon training manuals are written by men. And while these men are experts when it comes to how men can and should train, Women need training programs tailored to their bodies so that they can avoid injuries and run at their peak. The programming in this book was created by a woman specifically for women. Master the Marathon is a comprehensive guide to marathon training for women at all levels of running, beginner, intermediate, and advanced. It will help you unlock the strength and determination inside you to embark on the spectacular journey that is the marathon. And from Keyshawn Johnson and Bob Glauber, we have The Forgotten First. More than a year before Jackie Robinson broke the color barrier in Major League Baseball, there was another seismic moment in pro sports history. On March 21st, 1946, former UCLA star running back Kenny Washington, a teammate of Robinson's in college, signed a contract with the Los Angeles Rams. This ended one of the most shameful periods in NFL history, when African-American players were banned from league play. Washington would not be alone in serving as a pioneer for NFL integration. Just months after he joined the Rams, thanks to a concerted effort by influential Los Angeles political and civic leaders, the team signed Woody Strode. In that same year, a little-known coach named Paul Brown of the fledgling Cleveland Browns signed running back Marion Motley and defensive lineman Bill Willis, thereby integrating a startup league that would eventually merge with the NFL. The Forgotten First tells the story of one of the most significant cultural shifts in pro football history, as four men open the door to opportunity and change the sport forever. And another football story, Hail Mary, the Rise and Fall of the National Women's Football League by Brittany De La Cretas and Lindsay D'Arcangelo. In 1967, a Cleveland businessman had a brilliant idea. Why not start a women's football team? It was conceived as a gimmick and a publicity stunt in the vein of the Harlem Glo Globetrotters. He recruited women to compete as a traveling football troupe. Much to his surprise, he learned that women, women really wanted to play and play hard. Hail Mary is the story of the unlikely rise of the National Women's Football League and the players who loved a game that society, society told them they shouldn't be playing. In 19 cities across the country, against the backdrop of second wave feminism and the passage of Title IX, these athletes broke new barriers and showed adoring crowds what women were capable of physically. Hail Mary is a celebration of women athletes and their fight on and off the field and a powerful story of the league that changed their lives and the course of women's sports. And next we have some cookbooks, starting with Baking for the Holidays by Sarah Kiefer. Kiefer, author of 100 Cookies, offers more than 50 delicious recipes for seasonal brunches, cookie swaps, and all those Christmas, Hanukkah, and New Year's Eve parties. With cozy holiday imagery, a lovely clean aesthetic, and easy yet innovative recipes, this is a go-to cookbook for baking enthusiasts of all ages and anyone who loves the holiday season. And America's Test Kitchen has a new book out called The Complete Autumn and Winter Cookbook. As the air grows chillier and nights longer, these dishes draw us to the table and the warmth of an active kitchen. When the flavors of summer fade, autumn and winter fruits and vegetables can be just as bold and bountiful. Themes chapters showcase all the reasons to love autumn and winter cooking. Find new celebration favorites, create the ultimate party spread. <clears throat> Try new apple and pumpkin recipes, bake to your heart's content, or give the gift of food with this wide range of over 550 recipes. <clears throat> and from Bryant Terry, we have black food, stories, art, and recipes from across the African diaspora. In this stunning and deeply heartfelt tribute to Black culinary ingenuity, 
Bryant Terry captures the broad and divergent voices of the African diaspora through the prism of food. With contributions from more than 100 Black cultural luminaries from around the globe, the book moves through chapters exploring parts of the Black experience, from homeland to migration, spirituality to Black future, offering delicious recipes, moving essays, and arresting artwork. Black food is a visual and spiritual feast that will satisfy any soul. In a couple of travel books, starting with Atlas Obscura's Gastro Obscura, it is truly a feast of wonder. Created by the ever-curious minds behind Atlas Obscura, this breathtaking guide transforms our sense of what people around the world eat and drink. Covering all seven continents, Gastro Obscura serves up a loaded plate of incredible ingredients, food adventures, and edible wonders. Ready for a beer made from fog in Chile, Sardinia's Threads of God pasta, or Egypt's 2,000-year-old egg ovens? But far more than a menu of curious minds, delicacies, and unexpected dishes, Gastro Obscura reveals food's central place in our lives, as well as our bellies, touching on history, culture, travel, and festivals. Discover hidden gems that might be right around your corner, like the vending machine in Texas dispensing full-size pecan pies. Dig in and feed your sense of wonder. And National Geographic has 100,000 perfect weekends, great getaways around the globe. Whether you're looking for a way to unplug from a busy work week, take the family on a quick getaway, or add it to a vacation itinerary, this practical and inspiring book provides the perfect way to plan your next escape. Spend two days sailing off the coast of the Bahamas, indulge in a foodie tour of Mexico City's markets, take a drive through Italy's Chocolate Valley, or escape the world's largest ice rink at Ottawa's Winter Festival. Divided by theme and interest, including nature parks, city escapes, country weekends, mountain retreats, and more, this fun-packed guide offers an adventure you can experience in 36 to 72 hours. <laughs> and last up, we've got a new self-help book. We have Feeding the Soul by Tabitha Brown. <laughs> Before Tabitha Brown was one of the most popular personalities in the world, sharing her delicious vegan home cooking and compassionate wisdom with millions of followers across social media, she was an aspiring actress who in 2016 began struggling with undiagnosed chronic autoimmune pain. <clears throat> her condition made her believe she wouldn't live to see 40 until she started listening to what her soul and her body truly needed. Now in this life-changing book, Tabitha shares the wisdom she gained from her own journey, showing readers how to make a life for themselves that is rooted in non-judgmental kindness and love, both for themselves and for others. <clears throat> Rich with personal stories and inspirational quotes and sprinkled with a few easy vegan recipes, Beating the Soul is a book to share and to return to when you want to feel seen, loved, and heard. That is it for me. Thank you for listening to me talk about these books that I'm very excited about. If you have any questions, you can always email me. And with that, I will hand it over to Meg, who will be covering adult graphic novels. Good evening. I'm Meg Miller, an adult services librarian. I bring you new and upcoming graphic novel and manga titles being added to our collection. If you haven't visited recently, you might not have seen the new home of the adult graphic novels pictured here on the right and the newly created adult manga collection, pictured here on the right. In case you haven't heard, we're proud to be a 2021 Texas Book Festival grant recipient of $2,500 to seed an adult manga collection. Those manga titles we already have, like Way of the House Husband, So Cute It Hurts, and others have been recatalogued to get us started. To start my book buzz tonight, I'm gonna go with three manga titles. First from Viz Media, Mao Volume One, Exercise your destiny in an era-spanning supernatural adventure from manga legend Rumiko Takahashi. When Anoka travels back in time to a supernatural er early 20th century, she gets recruited by aloof exorcist Mao. What is the thread of fate that connects them? Together they seek answers and kick some demon butt along the way. So Nanoka passes through a portal into the Taisho era where exorcist Mao reluctantly rescues her from the jaws of a grotesque yokai. When Nanoka gets back to the present, she discovers she has some new incredible abilities. She returns to the past looking for answers only to get caught up in Mao's investigation of a series of gruesome murders. As her questions about herself multiply, Nanoka learns that Mao is cursed by a cat demon named Yoki. 
and so is his sword. If anyone but Mao attempts to wield it, they are doomed. But when Mao's life is in jeopardy, Nanoka picks up his blade and swings. Next from A Blaze, Crueler Than Dead, Volume 1. No one knows where it started, but when the world finally realized what was going on, it was already too late. When Makiaki wakes up in a lab full of corpses, she learns from a dying soldier that she is the result of a last-ditch experiment to cure humans of a virus turning them into zombies. Accompanied by a young boy who has also mir miraculously escaped, she will have to try to get to the very center of a devastated Tokyo filled with bloodthirsty monsters. The dome located there contains the last survivors of mankind, and humanity's very survival depends solely on a few drops of this miraculous vaccine. Inspired by Akira, The Walking Dead, Romero classics, and new zombie films like 24 Hours Later, Crueler Than Dead delights in the meticulous detail of decomposed flesh with a wicked and hungry eye, evoking a modern vision of a zombie world that is terrifying and tension-filled. And third, Never Open It, the Taboo Trilogy from Yen Press. It's a collection of three stories from Ken Niyamura that are rooted in well-known Japanese folk tales such as Yurashima Taro and The Crane Wife. Each story delves into the concept of the taboo, asking questions such as, why are these rules meant to be followed? And who and why sets these rules? Taking inspiration from the Japanese folk tales told to Ken as a child and combining them with his unique and captivating art style, Never Open It, the Taboo Trilogy is a must-read graphic novel for fans of beautiful literary comics. And moving on to some new titles, we have one I've been looking forward to from IDW, Scarin' Hood. What's scarier, fighting demons or letting your kids down? That's what a group of parents will find out as their plans to solve the school's long-standing mystery lead to one parenting nightmare after another. To-do list, drop the kids off at preschool, grab coffee with other parents, Go ghost hunting in the woods, fight demonic entity, collect kids, nap time. With the kids away on a field trip, a group of parents disturbs an ancient evil buried beneath the old church hall, unearthing a decades-old mystery about a missing child and inviting something hungry into their lives. Suddenly, their mornings go from playdates and peanut allergies to a battle for the souls of one broken family and one child in particular. In this original story that combines the highs of parenthoods with horror movie scares, which Kieran Gillen says is brutally funny horror that finds genuine terror and honest, messy humor in parenthood. I love this. Next up, Noir is the New Black from Fair Square Comics. 40 Black creators, 16 noir stories. Unhinged, unfiltered, unstoppable. This is Noir is the New Black. There certainly have been many noir comics written and drawn by black creators in the past. Now for the first time, the most revered black American comic book creators, David F. Walker, Brandon Thomas, M.D. Bright, Melody Cooper, and Stephen Harris, Gary Phillips, as well as a new generation of writers and artists of color are banding together for a unique anthology of 100% creator owned black noir comic stories. This new edition includes one new story, The Circuit, by C.C. Harris and David Brain, as well as a behind-the-scenes bonus section featuring black and white art. Next is one that I highlighted in July. Memorial Ride from UNM Press is a high-speed ragtag chase across the American Southwest. Cooperstown, an American Indian soldier, has returned from the Middle East to attend his father's funeral make some quick cash off his father's old Harley, and spend a whirlwind weekend with his girlfriend, Sherry Munn. However, when Coop runs afoul of the violent John Wayne gang, he and Sherry Munn have no choice but to twist the throttle back on that story chopper and make tracks. In the spirit of Billy Jean, but fully aware of Billy Jack, Cooper and Sherry Munn's race to survive is full speed ahead with many potholes in their path. Turning the traditional Western on its head, Memorial Ride recasts the genre as a road movie. It's raucous, it's violent, and scarily enough, it might even be true. In short, this graphic novel delivers the storytelling prowess of Stephen Graham Jones through Maria Wolfe's artwork, and the result is a ride you'll want to take again and again. And from Image, Jules Verne's Lighthouse. In this adaption of the Jules Verne's classic, set in the year 2717, the Lighthouse is a supercomputer the size of a skyscraper that guides spacecraft through a turbulent sea of wormholes. 
Maria Vasquez has chosen this isolated base to escape her troubled past, but now she and her glitchy nanny bot Moses are the only ones who can stop a crew of murderous pirates from seizing the most devastating weapons ever created. And another one I'm excited for from Dark Horse Books, The House. During the Battle of the Bulge, a squadron of U.S. soldiers is caught in a blizzard while patrolling through the woods. Seeking refuge from the impending whiteout, they stumble across an abandoned manor, seeking shelter and safety. Once inside, however, the doors disappear. The rooms begin to morph. Exits become entrances, and they quickly realize there is no safety to be found. As their eyes deceive them, their minds descend into madness, panic, and paranoia. Is this real? Or is there more to this labyrinth than what resides in the walls? Secrets are revealed, history is retold, and death is the only mercy. The acclaimed psychological tale of supernatural evil amid the horrors of world war from Drew Zucker and Philip Sevy. Now with a new cover and additional bonus material. Next, the waiting from Drawn and Quarterly. The story begins with a mother's confession. Sisters permanently separated by a border during the Korean War. Kim Suk Jendry Kim was an adult when her mother revealed a family secret. She had been separated from her sister during the Korean War. It's not an uncommon story. The peninsula was split across the 38th parallel, dividing one country into two. As many fled the violence in the north, not everyone was able to make it south. Her mother's story inspired Gendry Kim to begin interviewing her and other Koreans separated by the war. That research fueled a deeply resonant graphic novel. The Waiting is a fictional story of Guija told by her novelist daughter, Gina. When she was 17 year old, years old, after hearing that J the Japanese were seizing unmarried girls, her family married her in a hurry to a man she didn't know. Japan fell, Korea gained its independence, and the couple started a family. But the peace didn't come. The young family of four fled south. On the road, while breastfeeding and changing her daughter, she was separated from her husband and son. Then 70 years passed, 70 years of waiting, She's now an elderly woman and Gina can't stop thinking about the promise she made to her mother to help her find her brother. Expertly translated from the Korean by the award-winning translator Janet Hong, The Waiting is the devastating follow-up to Gendry Kim's Grass, which appeared on best of the year lists from the New York Times, The Guardian, Library Journal, and more. Next, Bank Shot from Dark Horse Comics. A past betrayal has primed Marcus King for revenge. And now that he's been given enhanced abilities, the fuse is lit. From the mountains of the Ukraine to a lush tropical island, no place is safe from his vengeance. Marcus King is a modern day Robin Hood, or is he a terrorist? Maybe both. When Marcus comes face to face with an adversary who knows all of his carefully buried truths, he's forced to become the man he has always pretended to be. God help his enemies. And Grim Tales from the Cave from Mad Cave Studios. Expect familiar stories with modern sensibilities and new terrifying illustrations. With an all original 20 page story from writer Colin Bunn and artist Andrea Muti using the Grim Fairy Tales as inspiration. This is Mad Cave's first ever horror anthology based on a variety of the tales featuring over 10 haunting stories from a range of creators. In addition to industry veterans like Mark London and Stephanie Phillips, this anthology will feature work from all of Mad Cave's 2020 talent search winners. Pretty cool. And next on to some new series for your consideration. Another one I highlighted back in July, Stray Dogs from Image Comics. It's scary being the new dog. In this suspenseful new series, readers meet Sophie, a dog who can't remember what happened. She doesn't know how she ended up in this house. She doesn't recognize any of these other dogs. She knows something terrible happened, but she just can't recall. Wait, where's her lady? It's all coming back to her now, and it's enough to raise Sophie's half a goals. Now Sophie has to figure out where she is, what's happening, and how she's going to survive this. They say there's no such thing as a bad dog, just a bad owners. Stray Dogs is a heartbreakingly adorable suspense thriller by My Little Pony comic artists Tony Fleece and Trish Forstner. It's Lady in the Tramp meets Silence of the Lambs. And next up from Image Comics is The Good Asian Volume 1. Uh, writer Portensack Pinchot's long-awaited follow-up to the critically acclaimed Infidel with stunning art by Alexandra Tefkinki. 
following Edison Harkey, a haunted, self-loathing Chinese-American detective on the trail of a killer in 1936 Chinatown. The Good Asian is a Chinatown noir starring the first generation of Americans to come of age under an immigration ban. The Chinese, as they, they're besieged by rampant murders, abusive police, and a world that seemingly never changed. Um, James Tynan called it a smart classic noir drenched in style and history. And this character might look a little familiar. Um, Keanu Reeves is making his comic book writing debut alongside New York Times bestseller, bestselling co-writer Matt Kent and acclaimed artist Ron Garney in a brutally violent new series about one immortal warrior's fight through the ages, a war with no end. The man known only as B is half mortal and half God cursed and compelled to violence, even at the sacrifice of his sanity. But after wandering the world for centuries, the berserker may have finally found a refuge, working for the U.S. government to fight the battles too violent and too dangerous for anyone else. In exchange, B will be granted the one thing he desires, the truth about his endless blood-soaked existence and how to end it. A brutally violent new series about one immortal warrior's fight through the ages. Next, some other familiar characters from Dark Horse, Black Hammer Visions Volume 1. Creators such as Pat Oswald, Jeff Johns, Mariko Tamaki, Scott Snyder, Chip Zdarsky, Kelly Thompson, Colin Bunn, Johnny Christmas, Cecil Castellucci, and many more of comics' top counts take on some of the greatest heroes and villains of Spiral City. This collection launches the beginning of a special two-volume hardcover series of exciting stories taking place in the world of Jeff Lemire and Dean Ormson's Eisner Award-winning Black Hammer superhero comics. This graphic novel collects Black Hammer Visions number one through four and also features a ske sh sketchbook section and pinups by Gilbert Hernandez, Evan Dorkin, Kelly Jones, Christina Chung, and more. And next is the Electric Black Volume 1 from Scout Comics. The Electric Black is a horror series set in an antique shop that travels through time and space, delivering cursed objects to unsuspecting customers. Written and illustrated by Joseph Smalky and Rich Woldall, published quarterly by Black Caravan, a Scout Comics imprint, the Electric Black Cursed Antique Shop, appearing in any time and space, collect soliciting customers it hungers to corrupt or devour. The mysterious Julius Black is the store's demonic proprietor and narrator. He, along with his psychopathic employees, regularly manipulates patrons for their own devious purposes. Inside the eerie emporium, all of the forbidden objects have secrets to unlock. The poor soul that enters never leave without something. Its dark light will shine on macabre mysteries, grisly murders, and other frightful occurrences. Dare you step within its sinister walls? Oh, I'm going to dare. Also from Image, we have The Silver Coin Volume 1. The story starts with a failing rock band whose fortune changes overnight when they find the mysterious silver coin. Next, it helps handle some mean girls at a sleepaway camp. Follow the curious token as it changes hands over centuries, from Puritan New England to the scavenged junk lands of 2467, and discover how much pain a cursed coin can purchase. Eisner winning artist Michael Walsh teams with all-star collaborators Chip Zdarsky, Kelly Thompson, Ed Brisson, and Jeff Lemire on this new ongoing horror anthology series for mature readers. This one I'm excited for, another one, Nottingham Volume 1 from Mad Cave Studios. In this twisted medieval noir, the sheriff of Nottingham hunts a serial killer with a penchant for tax collectors. The sheriff's investigation leads him to target English's most nefarious power brokers. That's to say nothing of the merry men, terrorists lurking among the trees of Sherwood, led by an enigma known only as Hood. Mad Cave Studios presents Nottingham, but not as you remember it. And one more new series, EXO, The Legend of Whale Williams, Volume 1. Um, this is a Dark Horse book, but part of the unique universe, which is an extraordinary fantasy and superhero stories inspired by African history, culture, and mythology created by the best Nigerian comics talents. So in this one, the oldest son of a world-renowned scientist, Whale Williams, AKA tech-savvy superhero EXO, tries to save Lagoon City from a deadly group of emerging extremists. But before this pending superhero can do any good for his city, there is one person he must save first, himself. This is an Afrofuturist superhero story about the redemption set in the bustling metropolis that is Lagos, Nigeria, with a creative team that's also from Lagos. 
Our mission is and always has been about empowering African creatives and storytelling while bringing both to a global audience, says Royo Kupu, the founder of Unique Studios. And for some series that you've been following, we've got Monstrous Volume 6, The Vow from Image Comics. Uh, war has engulfed the known world and Micah Halfwolf is at its epicenter. As she and her friends grapple with the consequences of their actions, long buried secrets and long awaited reunions threaten to change everything. Join Marjorie Liu and Sana Takeda in the newest volume of this Eisner, Hugo, Harvey and British fantasy award-winning series. Plus, Learn about the happier childhood days of Kippa and Micah in Monstrous Talk Stories 1 and 2. And for the Descender fans, Ascender Volume 4, Starseed from Image Comics. The epic space fantasy saga from creators Jeff Lemire and Dustin Wynn that began in the pages of Descender comes to a spectacular conclusion. As Mother rallies her forces to wipe out the resistant, our heroes meet an old friend who re revel reveals the untold secrets of the universe. With the fate of all things hanging in the balance, who will remain standing when the forces of magic and technology collide? And Bitterroot from Image as well. Volume 3, Legacy. It is 1925, a great evil has invaded the world and the monster hunting Sangre family is about to discover that they do not have what it takes to protect themselves, let alone humanity. The only way the Sangres can even ever hope to defeat the sinister forces ravaging the world is if they each face their own internal demons, but some will not survive. The Eisner and Ringo award-winning team return for the epic showdown that will determine the fate of one family and the world. But if you're looking for a series that have already been completed, then these books are for you. First, Perfect Timing, The Autumnal, the complete series from Vault Comics. is following the death of her estranged mother, Kat Somerville, and her daughter, Sybil, flee a difficult life in Chicago for the quaint and possibly pernicious town of Comfort Notch, New Hampshire, a home uh, town she can barely remember. As she and her daughter, Sybil, try to settle into a new life, Kat discovers that sometimes home is best forgotten. Well, for, welcome to Comfort Notch, home of America's prettiest autumn. You'll never want to leave. From New York Times bestselling author Daniel Krauss and rising star Chris Sheehan comes a haunting vision of America's prettiest autumn. And the Victories Omnibus from Dark Horse Books. Not long from now, all that will stand between you and evil are the victories. Heroes sworn to protect us from crime, corruption, and the weird designer drug known as the float. In this complete collection of Eisner award-winning powers, co-creator Michael Avon Oeming's hit superhero series, we follow the mature and bizarre lives of heroes and gods as they fight against the villains, conspirators, and powers that plague their city while battling the demons that haunt their souls. I love this cover. Devil's Bride, Red Bride, the complete series from Vault Comics. Both a master of the sword and a slave to it, Aragami Ketsuko cannot resist the tide of violence that would destroy her clan. Taking up her father's red devil mask, Ketsuko fights to save her people, no matter the bloody cost. What is the sword? Ketsuko carves her way through the world in search of the answer. In 16th century Japan, the fates of warlords ebb and flow like tides of blood, none more than the Aragami clan, who follow their lord clan in the red devil mask into every battle. But when Lord Amargami succumbs to illness, his daughter, the fierce Ketsuko, hatches a plot to save her people no matter the cost. Years later, as Ketsuko wanders the heaving battlefields of her ruined homeland, she discovers a chance to avenge the terrible wrong done to her clan, even if it means stepping back onto a road steeped in slaughter. From writer Sebastian Greener and artist John Bivens comes a blood-drenched love letter to samurai fiction in a chilling tale of guilt, trauma, and vengeance. Another amazing one from Vault Comics, Hollow Heart, the complete collection. Imagine a world where everyone can scream and be heard. Elle used to be human. Now he's a jumble of organs in a bio suit. Elle is also in tremendous pain and has been for a very long time. Hope arrives in the form of Mateo, a mechanic brought in to work on Elle's suit. Mateo sees Elle in a way no one ever has. And what's more, Mateo offers Elle an escape. But will their relationship set Elle free or tighten his shackles? Hollow Heart reunites tech creators Paul Elor and Paul Tucker for a queer monster love story about the choices we make between giving our loved ones what they want and giving them what we think they need. 
And one more here, Sea of Sorrows from IDW. Plunge headfirst into the icy waters of dread in this graphic novel of deep sea adventure with a horrific twist. In the aftermath of the Great War, the North Atlantic is ripe for plunder by independent salvage crews. When a former Navy offer, uh, officer hires the SS Vagabond, he leads the ship to a sunken U-boat and a fortune in gold. Tensions mount as the crew prepares to double-cross each other, but the darkness of the ocean floor holds deeper terrors than any of them have bargained for. From the creative team behind the horrographic novel Road of Bones comes an all-new tale of bone-chilling horror. And one final section to highlight some nonfiction graphic novels. Um, first up, A Revolution in Three Acts, The Radical Vaudeville of Burt Williams, Eva Tangene, and Julian Elting, um, from Columbia University Press, Burt Williams was a black man forced to perform in blackface who challenged the stereotypes of minstrel, ministry. Ava Tangley, an entertainer with a signature song, I Don't Care, who flouted the rules of propriety and re to redefine womanhood for the modern age. And Julian Elting, a female impersonator who entranced and unnerved audiences by embodying the female feminine ideal Tangley rejected. At the turn of the 20th century, they became three of the most provocative and popular performers in vaudeville, the form in which American mass entertainment first took shape. A Revolution in Three Acts explores how these vaudeville stars defied the standards of their time to change how their audiences thought about what it meant to be American, to be Black, to be a woman or a man. The writer David Hadju and the artist John Carey collaborate in this work of graphic nonfiction, crafting powerful portrayals of Williams, Tange, and Elting to show how they transformed American culture. Hand-drawn images give vivid visual form to the lives and work of the book's subjects and their world. This book is at once a deft telling of three intricately entwined stories, a lush evocation of a performance milieu with, an, with unabashed entertainment value and an eye-opening account of a key moment in American cultural history with striking parallels to present day questions of race, gender, and sexual identity. And from Humanoids, Lugosi, The Rise and Fall of Hollywood's Dracula. A biography chronicling the tumultuous personal and professional life of horror icon, Bella Lugosi. Lugosi is the tragic life story of one of horror's most iconic film stars and tells of a young Hungarian activist forced to flee his homeland after the failed communist revolution in 1919. Reinventing himself in the U.S., first on the stage and then in movies, he landed the unforgettable role of Count Dracula in what would become a series of classic feature films. From that point forward, Lugosi's stardom would be assured, but with international fame came setbacks and addictions that gradually whittled his reputation from icon to has-been. Lugosi details the actor's fall from grace and an enduring legacy that continues to this day. Dying for Attention, a graphic memoir of nursing home care from Conundrum Press. When Susan McLeod accompanied her 90-year-old mother through a labyrinth long-term care system, it was a nine-year journey navigating a government without a heart in a system without compassion. Her family, much like the system, erected walls rather than opening arms. She found herself involuntarily placed at the pivot point between her frail elderly mother's need for love and companionship the system's inability to deliver, and her brother's indifference. She had also spent three years as a government spokesperson enthusiastically defending the very system she was now experienced as brutally cold. Uh, McLeod's tone is defined by a gentle, self-effacing humor touched by exasperation for the absurdities and the newfound wisdom around expectations. Dying for Attention is the latest memoir in the graphic medicine field, uh, should be shelved alongside My Begging Chart by Keeler Roberts and Tangles by Sarah Leavitt. McLeod includes helpful tips for communicating with nursing homes as well as background research to provide a larger context for this under-discussed experience. Another biography, Leonard Cohen on a Wire from Drawn and Quarterly, a captivating, revealing biography of the legendary musician and poet Leonard Cohen, opens in Los Angeles on the last night of the man's life in 2016. Alone in his final hours, the beloved writer and musician ponders his existence in a series of flashbacks that reveal the ups and downs of a storied career. A young Cohen traded in the promise of steady employment in his family's Montreal garment business 
for the unlikely path of a literary poet. His life took another sharp turn when, already in his 30s, he recorded his first album to widespread international acclaim. Along the way, he encountered a who's who of mu musical luminaries, including Lou Reed, Nico, Janis Joplin, and Joni Mitchell. And then there's Phil Spector, the notorious music impresario who held a gun to Cohen's head during a coke-fueled all-night recording session. Later in Cohen's life, there's the story of Hallelujah, one of his most famous songs and its slow rise from relative obscurity when first recorded in the 1980s to its iconic status a decade later with covers by John Cale and Jeff Buckley. And the period when Cohen went broke after his manager embezzled his life, to, life savings which ironically sparked an unlikely career resurgent and several worldwide tours in the 2000s. Written with careful attention to detail and drawn with a palette of warm, lush colors by the Quebec-based cartoonist Philippe Girard, Leonard Cohen is an engaging portrait of a cultural icon. And from Street Noise Books, Power Born of Dreams, My Story is Palestine. What does freedom look like from the inside of an Israeli prison? A bird perches on the cell window and offers a deal. You bring the pencil and I will bring the stories. Stories of family, of community, of Gaza, of the West Bank, of Jerusalem, of Palestine. The two collect threads of memory and intergenerational trauma from ongoing settler colonialism, helping us to see that the prison is much larger than the building, far wider than a cell. It stretches through towns and villages, past military checkpoints and borders. But hope and solidarity can stretch farther, deeper. Once strength is drawn, of stories and power is born of dreams. Translating headlines into authentic lived experiences, these stories come to life in the striking lino cut artwork of Mohammed Sabin, helping us to see Palestinians not as political symbols, but as people. And this is a super interesting story. Shadow Doctor from Aftershop Comics. This is years in the making. The true story of writer Peter Calloway's grandfather, Nathaniel Calloway, a black man who graduated from middle school medical school in the early 1930s, but was unable to get work at any Chicago hospital because he was black and, una and unable to secure a loan from a bank to start his own practice because he was black, Nathaniel turned to the only other source for money in Prohibition era Chicago, the mafia, run by none other than Al Capone. One of the most profoundly fascinating, startling, and significant stories Aftershock has ever published, Shadow Doctor features the artwork of Eisner Award winner, George Janti with a cover illustrations by comic legend Mark Chirillo. And I think Biddy will be with me on this one. Murder Book from Andrews McMeal Publishing, a humorous graphic investigation of the author's obsession with true crime. The murders that have most captivated her throughout her life and a love letter to her fellow true crime fanatics. Why is it so much fun to read about death and dismemberment? In Murder Book, lifelong true crime obsessive and New Yorker cartoonist Hillary Fitzgerald Campbell tries to puzzle out the answer. An unconventional graphic exploration of a lifetime of Anne Rule super fandom, amateur armchair sleuthing, and a deep dive into the high-profile murders that have fascinated the author for decades. This is a funny, thoughtful, and highly personal blend of memoir, cultural criticism, and true crime with a focus on the often overlooked victims of notorious killers. And one last title, The History of Science Fiction from Humanoids. Journey through time and space with this graphic novel history of the science fiction genre from Jules Verne, Jonathan Swift, and Mary Shelley to William Gibson, Philip K. Dick, and beyond. Trace the progress of SF through modern times and learn why key figures and inventors like Thomas Edison, Elon Musk have looked to science fiction to predict the future. For the first time in illustrated form, this comprehensive history of science fiction traces its origin and in fascinating detail charts its history from its beginning as schlock genre to its respected status today. Join author, historian Xavier Dolo and artist Jibril Morset Vaughn in their visual journey into the expansive universe of science fiction. Who's considered the worst world's first science fiction author? How did American science fiction begin? What sci-fi novel is the all time bestseller? What were the pulps and how did they predict with uncanny accuracy the 21st century world around us? The answers are here along with detailed chapters dedicated to the founders of the genre and their modern day successors. Discover the origins of your favorite page to screen fiction movies, marvel at the behind the scenes stories of some of literature's most imaginative writers and find out why science fiction so effortlessly captures our imagination and makes us dream of new worlds. 
And as always, um, once again, here are our emails. We want to hear, we'd love to hear your requests. That concludes our September book buzz. Thank you for watching and we hope your TBR pile grew and you now know just the book to recommend or to gift.